Thanks so much for joining us on Bloomberg TV. Tom, I'm going to start with you. You have a deal with the LSE right now that is in progress. You're moving forward, but you have a group of Canadian investors who basically are saying that they want to do a hostile takeover with you. What's the latest on that? Well, Suzanne, first, thanks for having us. Uh, the, the latest on that is our board uh, remains committed to our arrangement with London Stock Exchange Group. We think it's a very forward-looking uh, and bold strategy to go create an international competitor. Together, we're going to have uh, 6,700 listed companies in our in our stock exchanges, which would make us the largest in the world in terms of listed companies. Approximately $6 trillion in market cap between us in terms of the uh, companies we represent. That put a second in the world. We're going to have about 1.1 million contracts a day traded on our respective derivative exchanges together. We're going to own clearing houses in two continents. We're going to have a technology distribution system and, and team that is outstanding with state-of-the-art technology, really the newest in the industry. We're going to have a physical energy business that's outstanding, and we're going to own an index business, which is really, really exciting. We're pretty excited about the future okay. together, and our board remains committed to that. Okay, so you're not interested in this pending offer from Maple Investments? Well, our, our board has a fiduciary responsibility to represent the shareholders and represent the best interests of the company, so obviously we're going to look at everything. Our company has not been for sale. What's exciting about our combination with the LSE group is we go forward in the future together where there's shareholder our shareholders continue to own and prosper from the development of the company. Their shared management, their shared governance. That's a really exciting proposal relative to cashing out the majority of our shareholders' interests. We think it's exciting. Okay, Steve, you're, uh, as I asked Tom, there's potentially another bid coming forward that could disrupt your combination. What will you do if another bid comes in? Well, I'm not a TMX shareholder, uh, but as Tom said, this transaction is about growth, it's about opportunity, it's about creating a new transatlantic competitor. But I have to say, if I were a shareholder of TMX and were offered a 25% discount to the current TMX share price in exchange for extinguishing my, my control, 70% of my interest in the company, and then a very dubious uh, piece of paper, highly leveraged, in fact, the most highly leveraged in the world, with all sorts of uncertainties, condition on acquisition of two other companies, condition on clearing competition authorities, and we've seen recently in the United States uh, what uh, can happen uh, in the case of a, an exchange already going hostile against another one, subject to competition approval. That is really half-baked. I mean, as, as an investor, I would, I would not really look at it in the absence of anything else. But we are, as Tom said, and I think he conveyed that passion. We have that passion shared on both sides. The question Tom and I uh, rarely get is what do employees think? And on both sides of the Atlantic, employees of both the uh, TMX group and the LSE group are anxious to get on with it. This is a great deal. We want to create a new transatlantic competitor. And frankly, I can't speculate on what might or might not happen and speculate further on something that it's not really doesn't really exist at the moment. Okay, so you're moving ahead with your deal. Uh, the vote is June 30th. How are those meetings going with shareholders, some of whom are here today? I think very well. Obviously, uh, we've uh, published a circular a few days ago. Uh, and it was, of course, necessary to publish. It's a pretty lengthy document, 760 pages. You need to publish first before you go and uh, solicit and, uh, and explain the transaction to, uh, to shareholders, which is what we're doing now. There's, there's several more weeks of work to be done. Uh, but we're getting very, very positive feedback. And shareholders that we've spoken to understand the uh, construct, understand the vision, understand the growth and the opportunities, and the benefit to both sides, to Canadian capital markets as well as European capital markets. But do you have enough support from your, your largest shareholders? Well, as I say, we just started uh, to speak to shareholders, but the feedback has been very, very positive. Okay. Uh, regulation is another issue, particularly in Canada, uh, Quebec uh, in particular. What are you hearing from regulators in approving this transaction? Any hurdles you're anticipating? Well, Suzanne, we're involved in a regulatory approval process. Um, we've made our applications to the Ontario Securities Commission and to the um, uh, Securities Commission in Quebec, the AMF. Those processes are continuing. There are going to be public hearings we expect in July. Uh, they seem to be going well, the discussions we're having with those regulators. We also have Investment Canada, a file there that's actively being reviewed. We're confident we're heading towards a favorable outcome in terms of those regulatory 
reviews and the federal government review, but it is a process and we're involved in it. Okay. Um, a lot of these mergers that have been taking place over uh, the past six months or so, the topic comes up about uh, loyalty to your country and, and patriotic uh, issues. It, you know, do you want to keep the exchange in Canada if that becomes an option? Well, I think we are keeping the, the interesting thing is we are keeping the exchange in Canada. What we're doing here is we're merging the holding company that, that owns the exchange and provides support services to the exchange, but importantly, we're not merging any of the exchanges, meaning the Toronto Stock Exchange, the TSX Venture Exchange, Montreal Exchange, Borsa Italiana, the London Stock Exchange will continue to exist as independent exchanges regulated by their local jurisdiction and working under the listing rules and the criteria associated with that. So in fact, we are creating national champions within a global enterprise. Okay. The, very, the topic comes up about the exchanges who are not involved in the M&A landscape right now. Uh, NASDAQ, a few years ago, you'll recall, the NASDAQ wanted to do a deal with London. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, they're again on the sidelines. Have you talked to them? Are you also looking at partnering with anyone here in the U.S.? Well, we're very excited for this plan that uh, we've been prosecuting for a number of months now, uh, as you can imagine. Very detailed conversation. As I said, our employees on both sides, they want to get on with it. They're very excited. So we're focusing on, on prosecuting and getting to a successful conclusion uh, to this merger between the TMX group and the London Stock Exchange group. The rest is just mere speculation. I'm frankly not very interested in that. Okay, so you haven't talked to the NASDAQ then? As I said, we're really not interested in that. We're focusing on this. Okay, and let's talk about when this deal, uh, if it gets approved, uh, what happens? Where are you going to be dominant? What are you going to, what are you telling shareholders why they want this deal to go through? Well, I think one of the key areas that we're going to have in strength, as I indicated earlier, is the listings business. Uniquely, we own and operate two of the best small cap markets in the world between our venture exchange market and the AIM market operated by LSE Group. If you think about that and then think about our strengths through the middle of the mid-cap region where we're actually very strong as is LLC, then LLC's premier brand as an international global listings destination, a company like Glencore, where do they look to list? They look to list on the LLC. That gives us within our group that full continuum of listing strength. I think it's a very exciting proposition for issuers around the world. The issuers I'm speaking to are very excited about that. So clearly, that's an area of strength. We have big ambitions in the derivative business. We have big ambitions in the post trade such a, business. Such as derivatives, what do you mean? Well, where, where? You know, no doubt if the Deutsche Börse uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange combination goes through, we think the dealing committee will look for alternatives in the equity derivative space. Who better to do? it than ourselves with a successful derivative operation in, in, in Canada and the U.S. between our ownership of Montreal Exchange and Box and our partners at LSE, the largest equity exchange in Europe. That's a pretty formidable group to create uh, a competitor there. We're very we, excited about it. We that. already operate the same platforms. Mm -hmm. Yes, fact, we have the same platform. We bought it. Yeah, right. That's how we got together to but begin with. But that deal with also is uh, still up in the air as well. If that deal were to fall through or if they were to uh, have to get rid of some units, how would that impact? your combination would you be interested in anything uh, I think I, I've been asked that question it's specifically in reference to life I think I, I think that time has passed uh, I actually think the, the Deutsche Bozo NYC it's a, just personal opinion is likely to go through um, I'm pretty confident that there will be major concessions required by competition authorities. I think competition authorities in Europe have spoken out already publicly, uh, so I, I certainly do not want to quote them. If the responsibility is theirs and it's their, their authority and their privilege. But we're looking here at the creation of a monopoly uh, in fixed income and, and equity derivatives. And as Tom said, dealers, banks, market makers, customers, no one likes monopolies. Going to retrenchment, whether it's national retrenchment or geographical retrenchment, and building monopolies is not the way the world is going today. It's an open world. It's a world based on competition, efficiency, quality of client service, low cost. So I, I strongly believe that there is a big, big opportunity available in Europe today to compete with a duopoly merging into a monopoly. Clients cannot be looking at this with, with favor. And there's a big opportunity for the two of us. As we said, we already operate the same technological platform. We, we in fact, this week offered uh, for the first time a new competing FTSE 100 products. There's a calendar of future product introduction. We're very excited about that. 
This will be all managed out of Montreal. It's a big opportunity for Montreal to become a global financial center, not to retrench to a Canadian dimension. This is what we seek to, to build. As Tom said, we seek to build a Canadian and European champions, but with global reach. Okay. It's very exciting. Um, and just let's just get your take on the economy. Things have slowed down a bit here in the, the U.S. Listings, you, you keep on talking about that, but if the economy slows and companies are less inclined to uh, raise capital, what's your plan for that? Well, we go through economic cycles. I mean, that's the reality. Uh, we're a bit fortunate in Canada because as a resource-based economy, with commodity prices being where they are, we're probably doing a little bit better than, uh, than, than, than other people may think. Uh, year to date, our volumes are actually our trading volumes for our equity exchanges are actually up. Um, our finance, total financings on the senior market are relatively flat to an excellent 2010 comparable, but our venture market financings are very very strong. Um, and I think a lot of that says that says a lot about what's going on in the resource space, and it says a lot about how we're getting global brand identity with our venture market, and and that continues to be a place where companies go to, to source new financing. Just to give you a feel for the numbers, last year on Venture we raised about $10, million, $10 billion in new financing yeah. compared to a billion dollars 10 years ago. That's how far it's gone. Uh, volumes are up about 17 times what they were 10 years ago. We think we have a small cap market that is very, very important and serves as a feeder to the senior market. Uh, so there are a number of graduations that happen from that junior market to the senior market. With LSE Group, we're going to have yet another extension there that we're excited about. So financings, I'm still remaining very optimistic about. Okay, great. Can I make a short point on this? Since I have the opportunity to speak not only to you, but, but many other participants in the financial services industry, we seem not to have learned. Every single financial crisis is due to the same root causes, our inability to monitor and manage leverage. Yet, the fiscal system, the treasuries of both European countries and over here in the United States heavily favor debt as a, as a capital raising tool versus equity. If you raise debt, you get a tax break. In fact, taxpayers in the US and in Europe subsidize debt taken on by banks and other financial services participants. Whilst equities are literally clobbered, the after-tax cost for a bank of investing, if they raise equities, 33%. The after-tax cost for the same bank in the United States to raise debt finance is negative 6%. It's a subsidy. When we understand that we need to rebalance the tax system in favor of equities, then we'll be able to put that equity in the hands of entrepreneurs. What is going to, at the end of the day, what we care about is creating jobs. What is going to keep, create good paying, innovation paying, uh, innovation generating jobs is funneling, and that's particularly an issue in Europe, is funneling equity capital in the hands of entrepreneurs. Today, we ask banks to finance SMEs. Bank returns are not suitable for equity financing for SMEs, for small, medium sized enterprises. Equity is the ideal tool. Yet, the treasuries of most European con countries continue to uh, bring a, a very heavy toll in terms of regulation and fiscal costs on equities. I think it's an opportunity to rethink future growth towards uh, you know, economic policies in particular, to take the treasuries out of effectively managing the equation uh, towards promoting economic growth and restate the power of equities. And what we're looking to do here is to create a new champion, a new competitor with broad transatlantic reach. And in particular, uh, as we operate one of the largest and most successful SME franchise in the world, focus on SMEs as a way to create jobs in, in the modern economies, particularly at a time of recession. Okay, Quasi and recession. just, yes, uh, <laughs> final question. I just want to make sure, uh, Tom, because, and Xavier way into, you haven't spoken to the Maple Investment Group. Is that true? That is correct. Uh, we, we, under our provision with uh, the London Stock Exchange Group merger, which we executed on February 9th, um, we do have a, a requirement that any interloper would have to present a superior proposal or something that would reasonably be led to believe to create a superior proposal. Our board's analysis of the Maple, Maple proposal, it's not a bid yet, it's actually only a proposal, it's kind of a three-sheet piece, piece of paper thus far, is that it wasn't a superior proposal. We articulated the reasons for that. And as a result, we have not had to engage in any kind of a discussion with them. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you.